It appears to be a normal landing as U.S. Air Flight 1493 lowers its main landing gears onto the runway at Los Angeles International Airport. And then, in a flash, the, hell? the 737 smashes onto a commuter turboprop that is sitting on the same runway, crushing the smaller plane completely. The window next to me started melting. In the early evening of February 1st, 1991, SkyWest Flight 5569, a turboprop carrying 10 passengers and two crew members, taxis toward an intersection of runway 24 left. Intersection departures, with a, uh, particularly for a turboprop, was a means to make their flight more effective and they could get off the ground faster. At 6.04 p.m., an air traffic controller clears SkyWest onto the runway but advises the plane to hold its position. And at that point is where the one of the big causes of this accident sequence occur. She does not immediately clear them for takeoff. There's a delay. Every second that goes by, there's a mounting threat. That's because minutes earlier, U.S. Air Flight 1493, a 737 that began its journey in Syracuse, New York, had been cleared to land on that same runway. All they see is the menagerie of light. It looks, in their mental picture, it looks like a normal landing runway. And as they're flying closer and closer, they still can't discern airplane lights from runway lights. They're all the same color. The Boeing 737's main landing gears touch down. Then, as the nose lowers, the landing lights reveal the turboprop. That's the first time the captain sees the plane. What the hell? There's an explosion on impact, and the small plane bursts into flames. But the 737 can't stop. At 70 miles per hour, it skids and finally crashes into an abandoned firehouse. The floor was heaving, uh, and it burst, the smoke burst right through, right in front of my jump seat. It was as if we were in the middle of a big fireball. Every passenger window was illuminated orange. But I can see every passenger that can, that can possibly have a view of me staring at me, looking for an answer. Flight attendants began shouting orders to evacuate, but because of the raging fire, none of the left exit doors can be used. The front right exit door is damaged and won't stay open. Only a few are able to escape from there. We jumped off the aircraft. I pushed the first person off the aircraft because I figure it's either you break your leg or you will not see your legs. The right wing exit becomes blocked, leaving only one more exit for passengers to escape, the right rear exit. In all, 67 of the 89 passengers and crew make it out alive, but not everyone makes it through the exit doors. We took a position on the nose of the airplane, and we happened to see that the uh, co-pilot of the plane was trying to get out of the window. I took the ladder, small 12-foot ladder, and put it up to the nose of the airplane. And I was able to take a few steps up and help the co-pilot out, pull him out, and cradle him like a baby, bring him down, and then walk him with another fireman to safety. The captain and the senior flight attendant are among the victims. I, I remember feeling just a lot of sorrow. Um, that two of my crew members died, that so many passengers died. With the focus on the 737, few even know there's a crushed turboprop underneath it. The small plane is twisted and mangled beyond recognition. There are no survivors. I did not know that we hit another aircraft until uh, we were in terminal, the terminal and they were doing triage on us. And I asked about the crew and they said, which crew? Investigators immediately began the grim task of finding out what went wrong. John Cox, who is now an MSNBC aviation analyst, was an investigator for the Airline Pilots Association at the time. As an aircraft accident investigator, it's one of the tougher ones that I have worked because there, there were still, um, some of the bodies were still in there. It was, these things are always catastrophic to work. But it is absolutely vital that a group of people do this job so that we understand what happened and don't have a reoccurrence. 
While poor visibility from the tower to the runway and glare shining into the tower are part of the problem, investigators focus on air traffic control. Air traffic controllers is a matter of routine, multitask. The 929, take Victor, right turn 31 right and hold short of whiskey. They're issuing landing clearances, takeoff clearances, so the multitasking on that evening would not have been unusual. It is very unusual for a controller not to remember that they have an airplane in position on a runway. But according to the NTSB, that is exactly what happened. It turns out that the local controller simply forgot that SkyWest was sitting on the runway intersection. There were some things that were going on that did get her distracted. 1493 checked in, she looked, the runway end was clear, uh, and it was, it was just a human error. I wouldn't expect that the, the, anyone on the SkyWest to have ever understood what happened. It was instantaneous. When U.S. Air Flight 1493 crashes into SkyWest Flight 5569, the aftermath is horrific. 22 people on the U.S. Air Flight, including the captain, are killed. All 10 passengers and two crew members in the small SkyWest plane also die. I wouldn't expect that the, the anyone on the SkyWest to have ever understood what happened. It was instantaneous. At the NTSB hearings, the air traffic controller, Robin Washer, testifies that she initially thought it was an act of terrorism. U.S. Air 1493 came over the threshold normally. When the aircraft blew up, I assumed that the bomb, that the aircraft had a bomb, bomb on board, then it blew up. Then, Washer remembers another plane was on the runway. I went to the ground control and I said, see if you're in contact with SkyWest 569. I went to the supervisor. And I told her, I said, this is what I believe you are She has a responsibility to ensure its safety from other traffic. That didn't happen. The sound was almost overwhelming. David Kelly, the surviving first officer, testifies that he and the captain were never made aware of another plane on the runway. As far as we could tell, there was nothing down the runway anywhere. That airplane all of a sudden showed up out of nowhere. Uh, the cabin lights went out, the emergency lights came on. For flight attendant Bill Ibarra, who was critically injured, the hearing is an emotional experience. I was filled with gr gratitude when passengers who sur survived came over and <laughs> thanked me for my actions. As a consequence of the collision, intersection departures at night are no longer permitted. And while on the runway, pilots are encouraged, though not required, to remind air traffic control that they are waiting for instructions. These types of procedures were completely capable of being done before the accident. This was a totally preventable accident. Across the country, and nearly two decades later, another crash caused by human error. Continental Connection Flight 3407 nears the Buffalo Airport for landing. The turboprop suddenly pitches up, stalls, and goes into a series of terrifying rolls. The pilot fights to gain control, but the plane plummets 1,600 feet into a house. This aircraft was five miles out. And all of a sudden, we have no response to that aircraft. February 12, 2009. Winter storms delay flight 3407 for two hours at Newark International Airport in New Jersey. Once it departs, the flight takes only an hour to Buffalo. But three miles from the runway, the captain runs into problems. The speed was a little higher than he anticipated, and he made an adjustment. And what he did was he reduced the power, and they also extended the landing gear, which adds a lot of drag. And the speed decreased fairly rapidly to the point that a warning device in the airplane activated. The warning system seems to take the captain by surprise, but it should be a fairly simple correction to get the plane's speed back up. 
Instead of letting the airplane's nose drop to build up that airspeed, he gave it full power and lifted the nose up. He should have done the exact opposite thing. Planes generally fly at a slight nose-up angle. This makes air move faster over the top of the wing than the bottom. This creates the important difference in pressure needed for lift, which allows planes to fly. But with too much pitch, the air pushes against the wing, not flowing across it, causing the plane to stall. And when it stalled, the airplane became unstable. It rolled off to one side, then another. Uh, he continued to have the nose up. The plane's stall protection system tries to take over by lowering the nose to gain airspeed. But the captain repeatedly pulls the nose back up, essentially putting the plane back into a stall. After three stalls, recovery is impossible. The plane crashes in the town of Clarence Center, five miles northeast of the Buffalo Airport. Everyone on board is killed, as well as one man on the ground. One of the victims is the daughter of former Continental pilot Mike Loftus. Mallow was going up to a reunion game. Basically, it was an alumni game at Buffalo State College for the women's program. I think I turned the TV on that night to watch it for a brief moment. That was when I had all those flames, and I turned TV off. One question investigators have is why the captain responded incorrectly when the plane stalled. According to the NTSB, part of the problem may have been the pilot's basic skills. The report states Captain Marvin Renslow never revealed to Colgan, the regional carrier for Flight 3407, that he had failed several certification exams. He apparently wasn't completely honest in reporting those. But while he was at Colgan, he had also um, not passed some of the tests and the check rides that he had had. Captain Renslow eventually passes all the required tests. Colgan points out that their crew training meets or exceeds requirements of the FAA. But former Inspector General of the Department of Transportation, Mary Schiavo, points to what she sees as a problem with the regional airlines in general, cost cutting. Their whole model, business model, is to fly inexpensive aircraft and save a lot of money because they have a fixed price contract. So if they can fly cheap planes cheaply, they make money under their contract. If they have more expensive pilots and more expensive planes, they don't. The Regional Airlines Association disputes that and told NBC News their focus is on safety, professionalism, and reliability of service. Still, there are differences within the industry on how much flying time is required to pilot a commercial airplane. You can be done with those ratings in as little as 350 hours of experience. And what happens is when people get out of flight school um, and they have their required government ratings, they then move on to the regionals because that's who hires them. While major airlines usually pay better, they also demand that new hires have 1,500 flight hours or more. Further blame could lie with how Colgan trained its pilots on the Q400 stall protection system. Although it satisfied FAA standards, some of the training was done solely in a classroom setting, not hands-on. 15 minutes, that's all they're asking out of a training program, and they didn't even do that. When Continental Connection Flight 3407, operated by Colgan Air, crashes into a Buffalo suburb on a wintry February night in 2009, there are no survivors. The tragedy raises many questions. The airspeed decreased, and after further pitch and roll excursions, the airplane pitched down and entered a steep descent from which it did not recover. One question investigators have is why the captain responded incorrectly when the plane stalled. According to the NTSB, part of the problem may have been the pilot's basic skills. The NTSB report also focuses on crew fatigue. Both the captain and co-pilot spent the night not in a hotel or their own beds, but instead in a crew lounge against Colgan policy. And once behind the controls, they violated the sterile cockpit rule, which may have been the cause of their distraction. During takeoffs and approach to landings, the pilot 
and the co-pilot, the entire crew, can talk about nothing but the flight at hand. The idle conversation that was going on seems to have distracted them long enough for the aircraft to get to that point where it was a jarring moment that caused him to react. The crash sparks enough debate that in the summer of 2010, the president signs a bill passed by Congress requiring commercial pilots have a minimum of 1,500 hours of flying time. But even beyond that, there are a score of other safety provisions. They would require the FAA to get much more tough on pilot fatigue. They would require that the airlines disclose who's actually operating their flights so that no longer could people buy a ticket on Colgan without knowing it. So this legislation is very significant. The companies let them down a lot. They didn't give them the tools they needed, I think, is really what it came down to. You got two relatively inexperienced pilots. It's a fact of life. Eight years earlier, there was another air disaster over New York, also caused by human error. An Airbus A300 takes off from JFK Airport to Santa Domingo in the Dominican Republic. Soon after takeoff, the plane encounters severe turbulence. It rolls, pitches, and then suddenly the tail snaps off. The plane nosedives into a residential area in Queens, New York. All the people that were on that airplane went for a, a very harrowing ride in the last minute of flight going into the ground. All 260 people on board are killed, as well as five people on the ground, leaving investigators wondering how and why the tail would snap off an airplane. November 12, 2001. It is a bright, sunny fall morning as American Airlines Flight 587 climbs into the sky. In the cockpit are two experienced pilots, co-pilot Stan Molin and Captain Ed States. He loved to get in the airplane. He loved to be in charge. He respected everybody's job, everybody's role. The co-pilot is flying the plane that is about five miles behind a 747 on its way to Japan. On the Earth, 587 Heavy, 1300 feet. We're climbing to 5,000. Since the Airbus is climbing faster than the plane in front of it, Flight 587 quickly flies into the 747's wake, causing the American Airlines plane to experience turbulence. This in itself is not uncommon. Airplane wakes are very similar to the wakes made by boats or ships. Uh, it's a displacement as the vehicle passes through this fluid, in one case water, in one case air. This FAA simulation illustrates a different jet flying into wake turbulence. The wingtips from the lead plane create what is known as a wake vortex. You can think of it as a very large cone coming back off the tip of the leading airplane. And if the trailing airplane intercepts that cone, you'll feel choppiness. Typically, the encounters are very brief, but you can hit them multiple times. And that is exactly what happens with Flight 587. An Airbus A300 takes off from JFK Airport to Santa Domingo in the Dominican Republic. Soon after takeoff, the plane encounters severe turbulence. It rolls, pitches, and then suddenly the tail snaps off. The plane nosedives into a residential area in Queens, New York. All 260 people on board are killed, as well as five people on the ground, leaving investigators wondering how and why the tail would snap off an airplane. The co-pilot is flying the plane that is about five miles behind a 747 on its way to Japan. Since the Airbus is climbing faster than the plane in front of it, Flight 587 quickly flies into the 747's wake, causing the American Airlines plane to experience turbulence. This FAA simulation illustrates a different jet flying into wake turbulence. The wingtips from the lead plane create what is known as a wake vortex. There are two wake encounters. Although invisible to the eye, they are displayed here in our animation. The first wake causes the plane to roll to the left, and the co-pilot quickly puts it back on course. But then, 15 seconds later, the plane is caught in a second wake. When this pilot got into 
the wake turbulence, the airplane started to roll, he put in flight control corrections that he thought was necessary to, to get the airplane back to a wings level state. But instead of leveling out, the plane moves violently on all three axes of flight, left and right rolls, side to side motion, and up and down. Then the unthinkable happens. The tail snaps off. The plane banks left and plummets into a residential neighborhood in Bell Harbor, Queens. Just two minutes and 24 seconds after a routine takeoff, everyone on flight 587 is gone. Let me go ahead. Yeah, just to let you know, we saw a huge, um, tremendous amount of black smoke uh, south of Long Island. Captain Ed State's wife, Mary, is home when she finds out about a crash in Long Island and contacts American Airlines. I got the uh, one of the chief pilots in New York. And it wasn't, the, I guess, you know, wasn't the ideal way of telling me, but I said, was Ed the pilot? And they said yes. A devastating loss of life, a horrible scene in a residential neighborhood. It looks like a war zone. If you've seen anything on television, it's just terrible. Just two months after 9-11, People are wondering, could this be another terrorist attack? Everyone should remain calm. We talked to the White House several times. There's air cover. In this anxious climate, the NTSB works to find the reason the tail of the plane broke off. The scars from 9-11 are still very raw. The industry was recovering. Traffic was down. People were apprehensive. It was a period of time that after 40 years of being in the industry, I've never seen before or since. I see the plane, the engine fall down. Two months after the attack, another plane is down. And at first, an act of terrorism is feared. We've uh, preliminarily uh, put the city on high alert, so we've closed certain things down just to make sure that we find out what this is all about. Former Inspector General of the Department of Transportation, Mary Schiavo, followed the investigation. That was everybody's first thought, but there were a number of, of you know, clues, and they came out really quickly that it wasn't because you had, um, you know, you had the cockpit voice recording. And then when they found part of the plane was detached from the plane itself, I mean, you knew right away because pieces of the plane just are not ever supposed to fall off. Once terrorism is eliminated as the cause, investigators focus on why the tail broke off. It takes more than two years before the NTSB findings are released. According to the report, the cause of the crash is the separation of the tail or vertical stabilizer due to the first officer's excessive use of the rudder pedal. The entire vertical fin, which is the vertical stabilizer as well as the rudder, separated from the fuselage and the airplane at that time became no longer controllable. Normally, pilots only use controls called ailerons and flight spoilers to roll the airplane to wings level. These are panels located on the wing. The co-pilot does this, but he also uses the rudder. This is the panel attached to the vertical stabilizer, or the tail. It moves the plane from side to side. The rudder is operated by moving two foot pedals on the floor of the flight deck, forward or back. It was his reaction and the overuse of the rudder during this encounter that generated forces that were large enough to actually snap the fin the vertical fan off. MSNBC aviation analyst John Cox is satisfied with the findings, but the report is controversial. Aviation safety consultant Greg Fife believes a closer examination is necessary. It's easy to say that the pilot put too much. The question is why, and that question to this day still hasn't been answered. The NTSB in its public hearing actually identified 11 events that had taken place involving these high loads where the vertical stabilizers fortunately did not separate. So now you have a trend here, you have a history, you have a historical record. But what I see in their investigation was they looked at all of these things in isolation rather than trying to find not only why the loads occurred, but how they occurred. And Mary Schiavo believes there is another issue. In their accident investigation, they have to rely on the manufacturers. 
And therein lies the problem. They had to go back to Airbus and say, hey, Airbus, what happened to your plane? And Airbus said, well, it was the pilot. The pilot used the rudder too aggressively. Why would you ever construct a plane and ever have the control system in the plane such that if it's used in a way in which it's allowed to be used, your tail would come off? It is, it is unthinkable. Airbus told NBC News that it was not a design flaw that caused the tail to break off. It was pilot error. The NTSB, in fact, did determine that. It also found that the American Airlines training program overemphasized the use of the rudder pedal inputs. Going a step further, John Cox says the rudder should never be used in wake turbulence. The best response would have been to let the airplane's natural stability work, work through it. The airplanes are naturally very stable. And so put some control input in to bring the airplanes back toward wings level and let it fly out and it'll settle right down. American Airlines told NBC News that it continues to be disappointed with the NTSB findings and believes that the design and rudder sensitivity were at fault. A decade after the crash, the report stands as written. But in August 2010, the NTSB started re-examining similar incidents and urged agencies to take a closer look at the rudder design. Pilots now understand you don't have to move the rudder that much as far as the pedals are concerned to create a large aerodynamic force. It's a powerful tool in helping the pilot uh, in roll control. So be sensitive to the fact that, hey, if you're going to move this, you better use it as a last resort. But this knowledge came at a very steep cost. There is this adage out there in the aviation industry, how much blood has to be spilled before we take corrective action? Safety does have a price. Coming up, without warning, a plane crashes into the Everglades. The tail actually turned over, and when it did, the floor underneath me split, and I dropped out. A jet is flying over the Florida Everglades while the crew is trying to fix a problem with the nose gear. It shouldn't be a crisis situation, but it quickly becomes one. The L-1011 crashes into the swamp, killing more than 100 people. What amazed me was they said that it was unsurvivable. How do you come out of that? December 29, 1972, Eastern Airlines Flight 401 is on the final leg of its flight from JFK to Miami International, carrying 163 passengers and a crew of 13. Ron and Lily Infantino were just married 20 days before and are now returning home from their honeymoon. It was a perfect flight, smooth, calm air. Uh, it was just a, a very dark night. The L-1011 is just five miles from the runway when the pilot extends the landing gears. Green lights indicate the main landing gears are down, but the nose gear indicator remains dark. The nose gear showed that it wasn't either down or up. It didn't say what position it was actually in. So they broke the approach and advised air traffic control that they needed some time to sort through a technical problem. Unaware of what's going on in the cockpit, flight attendant Beverly Raposa feels the plane turn away from the airport. I wasn't concerned because, I mean, things like that happened. And if there was a problem, we had a phone by each of the flight attendant seats. If there was a major problem, the pilot would have called us. To troubleshoot the problem, the L-1011 climbs to 2,000 feet and heads west towards the Everglades. The captain then puts the plane on autopilot. Everybody wants to find the solution. That's just nature. We're human. We want to accomplish the mission. The crew suspects nothing more than a faulty light bulb. The co-pilot starts to replace it, but he can't get the new bulb to go in. And this is where the insidious nature of human error begins to show itself. Ideally, someone does nothing but monitor the autopilot. But with the, the difficulty that the first officer was having with the bulb, the captain, understandably, wanted to try to help him. No one was concentrating on monitoring the autopilot. 
The crew is unaware that the airplane is slowly descending from 2,000 to 900 feet. Then from the control tower, they hear, How's it going out there, Eastern? And the first officer looks up and realizes something's wrong with the altitude. And he said, we're still at 2,000, right? And the captain begins to look and says, what happened to the altitude? And they begin to take corrective action. But it is too late. The engines roared and we hit and the world exploded. It was a huge fireball. The plane rips apart. The crash is scattered over an expansive area. I was in the tail, and the tail section broke off. And we began spinning. And we spun 1,500 feet. And at the end of the spin, the tail actually turned over. And when it did, the floor underneath me split, and I dropped out. In the swamp, Raposa is still strapped to her seat as jet fuel rains down on her. There is absolute silence. Initially, I screamed, you know, somebody help me. And I couldn't hear anyone. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I may, have, I may be the only survivor. But she is not alone. I have never been in anything so dark in my entire life. That's how dark it was. And I tell people, the only thing, time you could tell somebody was in front of you, you could smell their breath. Otherwise, you would never know they're there. Passenger Ron Infantino is also one of the 75 passengers and crew that miraculously survive. Swamp water is up to his chin. Every bit of my clothing was blown right off. The only thing I had left was the rims of my socks. That was the only thing. And I thought it was a nightmare. I, I, I couldn't believe. I was totally in shock. And then, of course, I'm yelling for my wife, and that was the last I ever saw of her. I never saw her again. Ron's wife, Lily, actually survives the impact, but is knocked unconscious and drowns face down in the water. The captain and co-pilot are also killed, along with 98 others. But what caused the plane to crash? The mystery lies in why the autopilot suddenly failed to hold its altitude. It turns out it wasn't a mechanical failure, but rather human error. According to the NTSB report, when the captain leans across to help with a light bulb in the landing gear indicator, he hits the control column, shutting off the autopilot. The warning chime went off, but no one seemed to notice. The crew not only didn't respond to it, they didn't actually hear it, or if they did, they didn't process the significance of it. It turned into a fiasco. Everybody was concentrating on this light bulb. Further deepening the tragedy, investigators discovered the nose gear had been down the whole time. It should be noted that planes can still land safely with just the main landing gear like this. But aviation experts say the crew followed the correct procedure. Pilots always carry reserve fuel on the airplanes so that there wasn't a pressing time criticality of we have to go land now. If they landed with the nose gear up, it's going to cause damage to it. It's going to be out of service for a period of time. There's going to be an investigation. Out of this 1972 tragedy came Crew Resource Management, or CRM, a training requirement that now ensures that someone must always monitor the airplane flight path. If there's a problem today, that Crew Resource Manager means the captain has to designate somebody to stay in control of the plane while they try to resolve the problem whether it's in the cockpit or whether it's in the cabin. Improvements have also been made to the autopilot. The warning system is louder and more force is required to disengage it. They were so distracted with the light bulb that nobody, literally nobody, was flying the plane. Could you imagine? Boeing 707 is just a few miles from its destination when all four of the plane's engines fail. America 052 radar contact lost. The jet silently falls through the clouds, slamming into a wooded hill on Long Island, New York, killing 73 people on board. There are no mechanical failures, no structural problems of any kind. It turns out the plane simply runs out of fuel. But how can such a fatal blunder happen? January 25th, 1990, when Avianca Flight 52 leaves Medellin, Colombia, just after 3 p.m., the tanks have more than enough fuel for the 2,100-mile trip to New York. 
a head approximately 81,000 pounds of jet fuel on the airplane when they departed. They had done the calculations for the flight plan, the amount of fuel they would burn going to New York, a reserve, some holding fuel, and then also enough fuel to go to Boston and land. With more than enough fuel, that shouldn't be a problem, but it soon becomes one. In New York, the weather was bad, so as they came up the East Coast, they began to be issued holding instructions, and they held for three different times. The delays total 77 minutes. Around 8.20 p.m., they have only a little more than 14,000 pounds of fuel left, enough for another hour or so in the air. During those holding patterns, that's when the, the flight engineer should have made sure that the fuel levels were fine. And heavy on 052 heavy, uh, I'm going to bring you about 15 miles northeast and then turn you back on for the approach. Is that fine with you and your fuel? I guess so. Thank you, Robert. They inquired with air traffic controllers about how much longer it was going to be. They were complaining about their fuel levels. Air traffic control asked where their alternate was, which was filed from Boston. But the first officer, who was the pilot handling the radios, told them that they could no longer make Boston. And that very significant statement was lost on air traffic control. At 9.22 p.m., Avianca Flight 52 is finally cleared to land. But with an extremely low cloud ceiling above JFK and strong wind shear, the pilot misses the attempt. The plane is again diverted from the airport. Nowhere did the first officer ever use the word emergency. If that word had been used, they would have given them immediate priority to try to get them on the ground. Avianca 52, climb maintains 3,000. At 9.34 p.m., Flight 52 runs out of fuel. The engines flame out. Passenger Nestor Zarate remembers that horrible silence. The lack of that noise is, is, is it's a horrendous impression because you, you have the wind against the fuselage. So at that moment, there was pandemonium. The crew calmly tells air traffic control that the engines have failed. They are quickly routed back to JFK, but it is too late. When the Boeing 707 crashes into a hillside in Oyster Bay, the cockpit breaks off, killing the pilots and flight engineer. They are only 16 miles from the airport. Come on, somebody get them back here. Miraculously, 85 of 158 people on board survive impact. They are pinned beneath the wreckage, but there is no fire. Clearly, if the plane had been filled with fuel, they would have been all incinerated. The NTSB report says the cause of the crash is human error, that simply the flight crew did not effectively manage their fuel or convey how low the fuel levels were. When we talked to the controllers today at the TRACON, none of them were aware of the priority concern and the fuel concern. The crash of Avianca Flight 52 shows that despite dramatic advances in aviation technology, clear communication from the cockpit to air traffic control is key to a safe flight. I think that our crew should have been more aggressive and more transparent in expressing the need to have a preferential treatment that night. Astonishingly, many of these crashes, as we've seen, were survivable. But recovery can be a lifelong process. You'll be all right. Everybody was demolished physically and psychologically by the crash. So surviving a crash is a miraculous event. And, and one has to be grateful that God or destiny or is giving you a second chance, but uh, there's a price to that.